What's your childhood mystery that you finally solved years later? When I was 12 or 13 I had a horrifying experience one night. I woke up, completely awake, not dreaming, and felt like I was encased in transparent concrete. I could only move my eyes, and even though I was breathing I couldn't control it. Everything was bizarre, and I could sense a malevolent presence in the corner of my room, but I couldn't turn to look at it. This went on for what felt like hours. I was drenched in sweat, and felt like I was suffocating, because my adrenaline had kicked in big time, but I couldn't increase my respiration. Finally, after trying to scream 1000 times I was finally able to get a squeak out. I kept going and going, until I was screaming at the top of my lungs, but my family didn't come check on me. After another 1000 tries I was able to start barely moving. I finally broke out of the encasement, and was able to move, and realized what I thought was my screaming, was a barely audible whisper. I didn't wake my family, because I had nothing to tell them that wouldn't be dismissed as a bad dream. I didn't go back to sleep that night, Z and I had horrific insomnia for decades, until. In my 40s I saw a documentary about people who said they'd been abducted by UFOs. It was a dry, fact-based documentary, and they had experts on explaining that many such abductees we are actually experiencing something called sleep paralysis. My jaw hung open. I called my wife in, as I had told her about my supernatural experience, and we listened as these scientists described my experience exactly. Here, after decades, was the clinical description that, literally, changed my life. My sleep began returning to normal, and my mental health improved. TLDR, I had an episode of sleep paralysis, when I was a tween, in the before times when there was no internet, and my traumatic mystery and insomnia had persisted, until I randomly learned about sleep paralysis from a UFO documentary in my 40s. As a kid, I played Medal of Honor, allied assault with my brother. We got to the 5th level, which took place in a rainy French city similar to Saving Private Ryan. However, we always got stuck on the first objective, which was to locate the bazooka team. There were no clues as to where this team was in a giant rubble-filled city with poor visibility. To make things worse, hidden enemy snipers would constantly fire at you, making the search much more difficult than it already was. My brother and I practically scoured every nook and cranny, but we never found this team. If the bazooka team was trying to stay hidden, they were doing a good job. In the months that followed, we reinstalled and replayed the game several times, but would always get stuck on that level. Fast forward several years, and I got the digital version of Light Assault for nostalgia's sake. I dreaded playing the fifth level, but to my surprise, I easily cleared the first objective by happening across the corpses of the bazooka team in one of the buildings. Turns out the CD we originally played on was bugged where the bodies never even rendered into the game. All we did was waste several hours looking for a group of people that never made it to the battle in the first place. Giddy at the prospect of finally completing the game, I happily continued the level only to quit when I kept getting sniped by those damn hidden snipers. I was brought up in Ireland and unusual as it was my parents never drank. Every Christmas our family friends would forget about this and give our parents alcohol as gifts. Naturally, my parents either threw the bottles of whiskey, vodka etc into the storeroom or rejected them. One year when I was 8 years old, my parents got this awesome bottle of 40 year old Scottish whiskey. It was a cool looking bottle, so they placed it with pride on the mantelpiece. I grew older, taller and was bit of a jack the lad. When I was 16, my parents decided to go out of town for the weekend. My brother who was 18 decided we should pull and back quote Ocean's Eleven on it and steal the bottle and go to a massive house party with lots of beauty looking ladies. I told him that we would surely get caught because this bottle of whiskey was the pride of the house. My brother who is so cunning that if you placed a tail on him, you could call him a weasel, explained that we would drink the bottle of the finest whiskey this side of Bonnie Scotland and take the empty bottle home and fill it with cold Irish black tea. We duly did this, and had an amazing time at the party. Mum and dad came home, and were none the wiser. Day turned into night, days turned into months, seasons passed, years went by and both my brother and I were in college. We returned home one Christmas, and noticed straight away that the bottle of whiskey was gone. 
we were like back quote Jesus Christ mum is going to murder us however nothing was said and we all had a great Christmas. Again the days and nights went by, season came and went, and a few years added up. I was around 24 years old and was working in a hospital for a while and often had lunch with the janitors, cleaners, and handymen that worked there. After three months, one older Irish gentleman that I got to know very well said to me, Old man, young man, do you like whiskey? Me, back quote of course I do older man, back quote well let me tell you a story older man, back quote many years ago, your father asked me to paint the outside walls of your home. When your father went to pay me for my hard day of work, I refused and knowing that they don't drink and remarked could I lift that 50 year old bottle of fine Scottish whiskey. You father thought this was an amazing deal and I went home happy. My wife made me a steak and pour me a large glass of whiskey and I sat on the porch on a lovely summer's day. Then I drank the fucking cool tea and nearly took a heart attack. At this moment, I was literally in the end scene of back quote the usual suspects. I couldn't believe it and didn't know what to say. Simply I was gobsmacked. I offered to pay the older man for his work however he refused and laughed saying that he was young once. I'm now 45 years old and my parents to this day don't know that we stole the bottle of whiskey, swapped it out with tea, and then a poor old man drank it years later and never got paid for his honest day's work. Only in Ireland folks. When I was a little kid in the 80s I was swept up by the satanic panic. I went to a catholic school in medium sized city and they really took it seriously. Everyone did. I was convinced that the entire world was secretly controlled by a cabal of devil worshipping such fiends and I was determined to grow up and do everything I could to stop them. Then sometime in high school the whole thing just went away. One day the satanic illuminati was out to molest every little kid they could find and then next day they were gone. Eventually I forgot all about the whole thing. Flash forward to my mid twenties. I was in college and sitting in my apartment getting high when all of a sudden I remembered the whole satanic panic. I remember thinking whatever happened with that, were they all caught? Did I dream that? Luckily the internet was in its extreme infancy, but since my rumored was a long time computer geek we had it in my apartment. So I went online and looked it up. I'll admit that I felt mixed emotions when I found out that 99.99% of it was total bullshit. I was both relieved and angry. Relieved for obvious reasons, but angry because it generated a lot of fear in me when I was little. Little kids shouldn't be hearing stories of ritual such abuse and violent sacrifices. For facts sake my school had a lecturer who was a priest who was supposed expert on satanism and he showed us a movie where some people killed and ate an actual cat. I was junior high age. We were told it was 100% real, and while now as an adult I'm skeptical it was it still looked real. Especially to a 12 year old. Anyway, the whole thing was faked up, but I'm glad I got closure. And now it's one of those things that people are now comfortable talking about. And being an adult I find the whole thing very fascinating. Everything from how it started to how it ended and everything in between is a pretty wild ride. Edit I'd like to first thank everyone for their comments, but I felt like I had to make one quick edit to sort of clarify one thing. My parents, and my extended family for that matter, were not involved in any of this stuff. Their religious inclinations were basically go to church on Sundays and send the kids to Catholic school. Hell, we owned one family Bible and it sat in the bottom drawer of my mom's dresser forever. But it being the 80s there weren't that many limits on the things I was allowed to watch on TV or anything. And sensationalized news shows and, especially, daytime talk shows are where I got most of my information. The Mystery of Zeus. When I was very young I very distinctly remember having a friend named Zeus. How could you forget someone with that amazing of a name? At some point, probably around third grade, he moved away and disappeared. I could never even find him in the yearbooks, it's like he never existed. My mother, the family, everyone kept telling me that I was imagining this kid. One day I'm telling my wife about my old best friend Zeus, the kid who vanished off the face of the earth and took every person's memory of him with him. I even showed her where he used to love when we drove by it, recounting the day I went to his birthday party and he had a great pinata. 
My wife stared at me for a moment and, very slowly, asked. Honey, did people yell for him a lot? Like, Jesus, come here? Well of course they did. How else would they get his attention? Jesus, what's up? Jesus how are ya? Duh. That's a silly question. And he had a pinnator? Yeah why? Sweetie I bet you his name was Jesus. Jesus? Zeus? It was like being hit with a truck of realization. I asked my mother later, and, yes, I did pal around with a kid named Jesus. It was one of the greatest mysteries of my life, one that made me question whether or not it was an imaginary friend, and it turned out to just me being a dumb as a rock kid. When I was in elementary school we were learning about different cultures and the folklore associated with them. I have a decent amount of Irish in my blood so naturally I perked up when they started talking about Ireland and more specifically leprechauns. Our teacher told us this tale about leprechauns and how much they loved flower petals and if they were ever caught they would give you a gift in exchange for their freedom. So naturally I started hatching a plan. Once I got home I told my mom all about what I had learned and how I was going to catch a leprechaun and get a gift. I picked some flower petals from my mom's garden, grabbed a plastic cup, a length of string and a stick and set up in the backyard. I had my trap in place, laid down on the grass, and watched intently for a leprechaun to wander by drawn to the smell of the freshly picked petals. About an hour passed, and I started to doze off. I don't know how long I had been asleep for, but when I awoke the cup was tipped over, and my trap had been sprung. I couldn't believe how lucky I was, I was so excited, and put my ear up to the cup to hear if anything was squirming around inside. It was silent. As I lifted up the cup my heart sank, because of course there was no leprechaun underneath. But hidden in the grass under the cup was a small green boot. I was so excited because I thought, well I didn't catch a full leprechaun, but of course he will want his boot back. So I ran inside and told my mom the whole story. She convinced me to write the little guy a note and to give him his boot back and perhaps he'd give me a gift in return. So I pulled out some loose leaf and a pen and wrote the shoeless leprechaun a note. I told him that in exchange for his boot I would want a gift in return. I placed the boot on top of the note and left it on the kitchen table. I also made sure to leave the back door open a smidge before bed. In the morning I rushed downstairs to see if my plan had worked. On the kitchen table the boot was nowhere to be seen, but in its place was this Power Rangers action figure that I had bugged my parent for a week or so prior. I was so excited and happy and brought it in for show and tell and bragged to everyone at school how I had cut a deal with a leprechaun in exchange for my new favorite toy. But life went on and years passed and my belief in magic faded along with the memory. Years later when I was in college we moved out of my childhood home, and during the move we all took the time to go through a bunch of our old things. I was helping my mom with one of her memory slash keepsake boxes, and she was telling me about the different items and what memories were attached to them. At the bottom of the box was a little green piece of felt that was cut and sewn into the shape of a boot. The memory of that day came rushing back to me as finally realized the effort my mom had gone through to make a little boy believe in magic. It is my favorite childhood memory now, and one of the most impactful moments in my life. I still get teary-eyed thinking about it, and hope to do little things like that for my kids, because little things like that really do make a difference. Love you mom. TLDR thought I caught a leprechaun's boot, and exchanged it for a toy. Years later realized my mom had set the whole thing up, to help her son believe in magic. Why my parents were so much older than the average mom and dad for a kid my age, and why I had two brothers named Chris. All my childhood, friends would ask if my parents were my grandparents, and why my twin brother and my older brother were named Chris. My parents were adamant that they had us later in their life, that we look so much like our dad when he was younger, and that they named my twin and I after our big brother because he begged them to. I shared his middle name and my twin shared his first name. When we turned 15, my twin and I were doing homework together and I ran out of paper. I looked in a closet and found a briefcase which I figured had extra paper, come to find out it had a bunch of adoption papers. My older brother and sister were adopted together, and my twin and I were adopted separately years later. 
Come to find out, my big brother and sister were told they were adopted and used running away to their biological parents as an ultimatum to try to get their way and ended up actually doing it at one time, which is why our adoptive parents never told us the truth. They were scared we'd do the same I guess. Long story short, I ended up searching for my real parents eventually and finally located a biological family member's phone number when I was 21. I quickly found out that our biological parents had both overdosed and died by time we would have been 4 years old. Pretty anticlimactic as I had a list of questions to ask them, but I was relieved to have some closure. I'm also blessed to have had such awesome parents, who in my eyes, always will be my real parents. Unfortunately my adoptive mom passed away recently as well. R.I.P. Mom. I'm autistic and a survivor of abuse because of it. I grew up in a dysfunctional family that has varying mental health issues and poor education. I was always a difficult child, particular, didn't like to do things the way people wanted me to, always thinking outside the box, and people, my family included, did not understand me, I can recall schoolyard bullies and my siblings basically trying to beat it out of me and make me normal. I was abused as a kid, and that abuse would slash how shaped me. When I entered grade school I was always isolated. I was the kid who didn't talk to anyone else and felt like no one would ever like him. I would be moved to the back of the class and sat alone. They used to test me to see how smart I was. They wanted me to take medication that I refused and I was also part of programs where someone would take me to a special room and would spend time being kind to me and taking notes. I would be rewarded by being allowed to play with the toys in the room for 20 minutes. As I grew up I struggled with depression and battled with it for most of my life. I wasn't great at making friends and always felt like an outcast. I felt envious of others who seemed to have life so easy. My teachers wanted to understand me, they knew I was bright, they were mainly confused about why I would never apply myself. I ballooned up to 360 pounds from the depression and overeating. The weight of the pain I felt for not being able to live life as I wanted to physically manifest it onto my body. At my lowest I wanted to end it all and voluntarily stayed on a psych ward to try to get help. Things changed when I decided to go to a community college. There I found that I was a gifted writer and was encouraged by professors that I was a bright man. Treated like an actual adult I gained confidence and I began to eat better and work out. I started loving myself. A few years later my nephew was born. My sister had always feared her child would be retarded, so when he had developmental issues with his speech, she took him to every specialist she could. I never thought my nephew had problems, I could tell he was smart, and he oddly reminded me of myself. We later found out that he was autistic. And as my sister began to learn how to care for her son, she slowly realized what I had known the second she told me that he was autistic. I was too. She believes that the entire family is on the spectrum, but for sure I'm right in between ADHD and autism. This revelation lead to me finally learning how to accept the things that make me different, to forgive and accept my troubled past, and to move forward in the healing process. The start of my journey of self-healing and personal growth was about 10 years ago now. I went from 360 pounds to a current 220 pounds, and at 28 years old, I now look and feel like the person I always wished I could be. I'm employed full time, I rent a room in a home, and pay all my own bills, and I'm growing as a person each day. Money is a bit tight, and I never knew how expensive life was, but I'm figuring everything out, and going to continue working on adding chapters to my success story. If any of you out there feel like, or have felt like I did, you can make the changes to become who you want to be. You can take control of your life. And the things that make you unique are the things that will propel you forward. Bless you guys. Happy holidays. When I was 3.5 we flew back to the UK from a year in Canada. On the trip home I lost Rupert my beloved teddy bear. I was upset for quite a while. Then one day I received a postcard from Rupert, he was in South Africa seeing zebras. Then he went to France, and I got a postcard from there and not long after that he sent me a postcard from Australia. Rupert was traveling the world and telling me about his adventures. My dad had a conference in Sweden about 9 months after we had returned from Canada. 
When we went to pick him up from the airport he was there as expected. But, when he was in Sweden he'd found Rupert in the airport lounge ready to come home, and he had his cousin James who looked just like him in tow. So Rupert returned to me along with James, and I got my teddy back, after he'd had a globe-trotting adventure. Fast forward 25 years, and one night at a drawn out Sunday dinner as the conversation ebbed and flowed childhood came up, and I asked my mum and dad what had happened with Rupert's adventure. They looked at each other, and dad said I guess we can tell him now. Mum told the story of how I'd lost Rupert on the flight, she'd called the airline, the airport, the hotel we'd stayed in, before we left Canada all to no result. She then went back to the chain store that Rupert had been bought from, but at that point, deceased Uncle Barry had bought him when I was born in 86, but Rupert was no longer available. Someone gave my mum the name of the manufacturer or distributor I'm not sure which whom she contacted and was told that they actually had two kicking around. She went and bought them both because taking one and leaving his friend all alone isn't an option and brought them home. However, they were brand new and didn't have the wear of 3.5 years of toddler love on them. So my mum took one and washed it a bunch, then dragged him through the garden, rubbed dirt on him, washed him again and generally tried to age him. While she was doing this my mum and dad had any friends that were going away on holiday, send me a postcard from Rupert showing where he was travelling the world. After aging Rupert my parents decided they needed to have a plausible way for him to return so, when we went to collect dad from the airport, mum hugged him first and snuck Rupert and his cousin James under my dad's coat. Dad then proceeded to pull them out from his coat and tell me how he'd met up with them in the airport in Sweden. To this day I remember being amazed that Rupert was sending me postcards. I never questioned that he could write, and him coming back after a 9 month absence was just magical. I never knew what really happened until I was about 30. Mystery solved. I'd always been the weird kid at school, smart but shy, got along better with adults rather than kids. People always seemed to act they could tell there was something off about me, like I was a robot sending off the wrong radio signals. When puberty hit, which is when everyone told me I would suddenly start being able to understand everyone, it felt like everyone had gone to a class on how to people, and I was absent that day. I was well known for being excessively blunt refusing to play along with stupid sheet, or staying quiet when a teacher said the wrong thing. This ended up with teachers who just flat hated me. I joined all the same clubs as the other kids, but every time it felt like I was an actor playing a role I didn't even really want, but I didn't even understand what I was doing wrong. I got interested in weird things that other kids my age thought were absolutely stupid. Like, really interested. I'd want to show others what I was into, and people looked at me like I had a screw loose. I couldn't understand how they couldn't find this stuff interesting. I know what I liked seemed far more interesting than football games or pep rallies. Instead of hanging out with all the other honors kids who were the popular crowd, I hung out with basically the losers that didn't fit in anywhere, a lot of kids who were just barely hanging on in school. I actually got told by teachers I should stop hanging out with these kids or it'd ruin my reputation. I laughed what reputation? Everyone knew who I was in school, but I was far more infamous than popular. As I got older, my ability to keep faking it seemed to go away, and things started bothering me more and more. Smells other people liked sent me into retching fits. Food other people liked I couldn't even hold in my mouth because of the way it felt. And people just did things and felt things I couldn't understand or even want to bother faking. I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder as an adult, and that seemed to answer some of the questions, but I still... Felt like I was somehow failing at being a human being. I was diagnosed also with borderline personality disorder, but the therapists kept thinking I didn't quite fit the symptoms, but it was the closest thing that fit to how I acted. I applied for disability because I couldn't hold jobs, but even though I was granted it, it wasn't for the bipolar disorder like I'd applied for, but for some unexplained severe social dysfunction. So, yeah, that didn't feel good to read, like there was proof I was a fuck up as a human being. Ten years afterwards, I started noticing my toddler son had some rather odd behaviors, and brought up with my therapist, that I wondered if he might be showing early signs of autism. 
she sent me home with a link to an in-depth screening site. I quickly realized that the test would be useless as it required me to be able to read my son's mind and know precisely what he was thinking. Out of boredom, I took the test myself. The results were not what I expected. I told myself it was probably just as reliable as other internet tests. Besides, everyone knows girls don't get it, right? So I looked it up and found a list of behaviors in women. I started sweating because I was on the list, just all the things I felt and thought and did, things I thought no one else did. I printed it out and handed it to my husband and he said, Jesus, it'd be easier for you to mark what you don't have. A week later I stormed into my therapist's office with the results, shoved them in her hands and said, how accurate is this sheet, anyway? She looked at me and said, pretty accurate, actually. I said, but that's not possible. I'm 40 years old. How the hell could no one realize it for so long? All the years I've been in the mental health system, and no one picked up on it. And then I realized I had to know for sure. I couldn't just let it go. I had testing done. The psychologist probably had the diagnosis at the beginning when he asked me if there were any interests I had that other people thought were a little strange or obsessive, and I talked for a solid 10 minutes before I realized that he probably didn't want to hear about Norse mythology and chaos gods and tricks to types and shut up abruptly. I had to wait 3 weeks for the results. I went to my therapist's office and she handed me the papers, saying, you have it of course. I knew you did, before I sent you. There in black and white was the diagnosis. Autism spectrum disorder. My own first false reaction, but girls don't get autism, was likely why I was never diagnosed. I'm very verbal, and did phenomenal in school. It all got chalked up, to smart people are always weird. Ironically, that loser group of kids I hung out with in high school, I still have contact with some of them. I learned that we were all neurodivergent, we'd all been missed as kids, and all were diagnosed as adults. It's apparently really common for autistic women to be misdiagnosed with borderline personality disorder because there is some overlap, and what with the perception autism is a male thing, people just ignored what didn't fit. It's likely the reason why my disability paperwork described what was wrong with me, severe social dysfunction, but never named it. It was like I had a puzzle I'd always had a piece missing of, and I just found the piece. I wasn't broken, I wasn't a failure. I just basically had a different circuit board with different wiring. I want to close on this. After quite a bit of fighting, I got my son professionally tested, and he is on the spectrum. Once I had my son's diagnosis, I now had to figure out how to tell him. I found a kid's book that explained it, and read it to him, and I assured him that there wasn't anything wrong with him, just difference and different was. Okay. The first thing he said was, are you autistic too? Of all the things I was expecting, that wasn't it. Yes. But daddy, and, his sister, aren't. No, they're not. He was quiet, and I asked him what he was thinking. It sounded scary a little, but you're with me too, so I'm not alone. I had to leave before I started crying. Trigger. Pet death. This is going to come off as so so bad. I'm sorry in advance. So when I was little circa 1985 I shwe adopted my aunt's poodle Muffy. Muffy was older. A few years later Muffy peacefully passed away in her sleep while my sisters and I were taking naps. Or so I thought. It wasn't until I was in my 20s and my sisters and mom were all talking about our past pets around the table. We talked about how Muffy must have known we'd be sad if she died while we were awake. Talking about of memories with the old dog and how stinky she was. Bad teeth and old dog smells, but we still loved her. This is when my mom burst into tears and confessed how she and my dad had helped Muffy die. What? She was real sick and was having issues walking, and she claimed we couldn't afford to go to the vet for euthanasia. She my dad laid her in her bed in a box, and helped her by way of the exhaust from the car. My mother was mortified that she kept it from us all those years, and that they never did it to any other animal, because after that they made an emergency vet fund. This I know, because of other pet emergencies through the years and they used it, when we had to put my dog Sparky down. It was horrific learning this, and my sisters were so angry at my mom for a while. Please. This was a one-off thing and my dad was a gentle-hearted man who only wanted our dog 
to have a peaceful release and could never have done anything painful even for a second to end it. It was the early ages, so things weren't as frowned upon then. They instilled the importance of emergency funds for things like the vet while teaching us about money when we were older. I personally have pet health insurance and always keep at least $1,500 in a specific savings account for my dogs. Oh god I have the perfect story but nobody will probably see it. Here it is anyway. Our family stopped celebrating Christmas when we, me and my two older brothers, were teenagers because we don't really believe in God. Everyone was fine with the whole arrangement, since me and my brothers are quite lazy when it comes to gifts and we would end up just exchanging the same amount of money as a present anyways. So one Christmas, when I was 14, and we didn't have a tree as usual, but on the first day of Christmas we found a tree in our garden. The tree was pretty small and quite ugly and beaten up looking. Nobody knew how it got there, and because one side of our garden is directly on the street side we figured that someone who passed by must have thrown the tree in our garden. Our best guess was that a Christmas tree seller didn't want to take the trees that he couldn't sell back home. We ended up decorating the tree, because why not? It actually looked quite nice, and we all enjoyed it. But we didn't go back to celebrating Christmas after that. Years later, probably about 5 to 6, when we were all home for the holidays, we remembered that weird tree that appeared in our garden. My brothers grinned at each other and then told us the story how the tree actually got there. They went on a Christmas rave the night before said Christmas, and on their way home, they were pretty drunk. They came by a Christmas tree stand that was closed and abandoned. They grabbed a tree through the fence and threw it over the fence, explained the beaten up look of the tree, and took it home. They said they didn't even knew why they stole the tree and why they picked the smallest ugliest one. When they got home they didn't know what to do with the tree and decided to just throw it in the garden. TLDR, we stopped celebrating Christmas, no tree and no gifts, when I was younger. One Christmas we found a Christmas tree in our garden and couldn't really explain how it got there. Years later my brothers confessed that they stole the tree on their way home from a Christmas rave. Back in the day, I got swept up by the website craze. This is before MySpace became a huge thing. I was part of an admin team for some video game forum hosted on Envision Free, and I slowly started learning how to work with HTML and such. Fast forward a year, and I'm working with the lead admin to migrate the board off Envision Free to our own host. Being teenagers, we didn't have the money to pay for what was basically a copy of our board, so we designed a peril spider script. To create new accounts on the new site and recreate every single thread and post from every single user. To do this, we had to figure out password hashing so the script would feed it to isolated instances of Opera to speed up the process. I also learned that by reverse hashing a password, you could dehash it and end up with the plain text password. So I figured I would try it out with my mom's Hotmail account. I succeeded in 10 minutes and found a conversation she was having with one of my uncles. Long story short, she hated being our mother, she hated my dad, and hated living away from her family. My uncle was trying to convince her to just bounce, and my mom wanted to make sure she would be set for life before trying it. My uncle's last reply, which is what I found basically said for my mom, to accuse my dad of domestic violence, as my dad had a temper. I forwarded it to myself and to my dad, printed the chain, and handed it to my dad after explaining how I came across it. My dad confronted her and never disclosed how he got the email. Twelve or so years later, my parents got a divorce. My mom crashed at my place for a while and tried to get me on her side. She planned to sue my dad and try to get an alimony, so she wanted to know if I would testify if need be. I told her I would, and I'd be sure to bring up the ML I found, and how the conversation went, and who was involved. I told her I had a copy of it still, if she wanted to review it. She called my bluff, and demanded to see it, only to realize I wasn't bluffing. She moved out a week or so after that, and has not attempted any kind of legal process. I talked to my dad about it, and I found out that the real reason my parents got married was because mom was pregnant with me. I guess it now makes sense why their wedding anniversary was in July and my birthday is in January. When I was 11, my siblings and I used to feed a scrawny stray kitten. 
my parents wouldn't let us bring it inside, so we made it a warm dry bed under our porch and brought it milk. We called her Charlotte. She was some kind of Siamese. She didn't drink a lot of milk, though, or eat much food at all. In hindsight I can see she might have been pretty sick, but I didn't know at the time. She came and went as she pleased, but one day, she never came back. The neighborhood kids were wild with speculation. One girl said she saw a man take her away. The man was a weird, quiet neighbor with a ponytail and motorcycles. He never talked to us kids, but he wasn't mean. He mostly came out at night, and he was always cutting grass or taking his grandma places. We never did find out if it was him. When I was 24, I joined an art class. He was in it. The class met weekly, and I got to know him and everyone else in it. We all became friends, and he still lived by my parents. He wasn't as much older as I thought. When I was 29, we started dating. About 6 months in, he showed me an old picture. It was a picture of his parents' cat. He asked me if I recognized the cat, which was fat and healthy and happy. I didn't. As if it was some horrific confession, he told me it was a cat I asked him about when I was 11. Apparently, I approached him and asked him if he took our cat. I don't remember, but I remember suspecting him. He said kids freak him out, and he didn't know what to say, so he lied and said no, just to be done with the conversation. What really happened is he did take the kitten. On his way to work one day, he saw a dead kitten on the side of the road in the blazing summer sun. He went to work. When he got home, the kitten was still there, so he got a shovel and scooped it up to bury it. He always cleans the street in front of his house. But then he took it out of the shovel with his gardening gloves and it breathed. He took it in and tried to revive it. He syringe fed it a little water and called a vet. The kitten survived after her hospital stay. He gave the kitten to his parents when she was healthy again, where it lived until just the previous year. He said he felt so bad for lying to me and he thought I would break up with him. We are married now Mayo. Every summer when I was younger, my little sister and I would spend a few weeks or so with my grandparents at their cottage. My grandfather would talk about the weather all the time, when the big current was going to come in, a pending storm, and my sister, and I got so excited, because when the currents came in that meant the next morning our grandmother would take us down to the beach, to look for seashells, that washed up on the shore. The current was so strong at those times the shells were pushed all the way from Florida, to an island in Ontario, Canada. I'm sure many people already know where this is going, but it was honestly the biggest thrill for my sister and I. We woke up at sunrise after my grandpa had predicted a storm more strong currents, must have been at around 6am, and as predicted, we would dig and search for seashells in the sand all morning. My grandmother had the best eye for it, she could always tell where they might be hidden from seeing signs in the sand, bumps etc. Maybe 5 or 10 years ago my grandmother offhandedly mentioned burying those seashells and it finally all came together. They made us believe it so well that we never even questioned it as adults. She must have been out there very late or early hiding those shells for us. Selecting the very best shells when they both did the Canadian snowbad ritual of going to Florida each the winter and bringing them back just for us. To this day, I love seashells. My grandfather sadly passed away from cancer when I was turning 20, but I'm grateful to have had him in my life for so long. My grandmother is 93 and still living on her own. I haven't seen her since the start of the pandemic, but I write her letters, send her tea, and call her often. This brings back such happy memories now that I'm a mom, making little magical moments of my own for my son. In fact, I think I'm going to call my grandmother and thank her for doing that and tell her I still remember. I was in Boy Scouts when I was a kid. At summer camp I got into a fight with another kid and we were sent off to the head scout master to get scolded. We get there and I'm mostly shutting up while the other kid is both angry and in tears, which was weird for me to see because this kid always gave off the tough bully vibe. He later got kicked out of scouts for throwing a folding chair, which hit the scout master's kid in the head. He was the one who talked the most to the scout master. Scout master, what troop are you two from? Bob, not his real name. Obviously, troop 101. Again, not the real troop number, SM. Troop 101, 
Sigh. You see that picture on the wall. You know what it is. Bob, an old picture of Troop 101. Then the scoutmaster spins us this yarn about the people he knew from Troop 101, and how great they were, and how we should be ashamed and blah, blah. I just nodded and apologized until we left. And I completely bought the story at the time and though it was a crazy coincidence that the ahead scoutmaster knew our troop that well. Well, until I put two and two together. Most likely, the people in the photo weren't from Troop 101. He probably pulls that number every time he has a disciplinary issue he needs to solve. Points at a random picture on the wall, says it's of whatever troop the kid slash kids are from, and makes them feel bad. And why wouldn't he? No kid is going to call him on that. Kind of brilliant dbh. As a child, before I went to school, I used to watch the afternoon cartoons. One day I turned the TV on before the cartoon started, and there was an extremely weird and creepy show going on. I realized that it was something for adults and I shouldn't have been watching it, and it creeped me a little, but I was more interested in it. Then some other day I specifically asked my mother for permission to turn the TV on before my cartoon started, and after that was nervous and ready to switch the channel, if she came to the room. From that particular episode I remember two scenes, in the first there was a man, the super villain, laughing maniacally and screaming I've created a world for gays. Translated like this in the subtitles, in the second the good guys destroyed the gay world that existed in a parallel universe and this was shown as an explosion on the sky above the beach. Needless to say, I didn't know what gay was. Years later when I was at the university, I suddenly remembered this and thought what the fuck had I watched. I figured it must have been some sort of agent parody, but I'd never seen it again on TV. I tried googling with all kinds of variations of universe for gays. I couldn't find anything. Frustrated, I talked to all my friends of the same age, posted film forums about this. No help. Then one day I decided that fuck this, I'm going to find out what kind of sheet had I seen as a child. So I googled once more, and found old TV programming info online. I was pretty sure of the channel was right, but I didn't know the exact year. Yet it was, before I went to school, so I could narrow the options for a couple of years. After this I manually went through the lists for 2 hours, until finally, I solved the mystery. And yes, I'd seen some really weird sheet that totally shouldn't have been broadcast in the middle of the day. The show was called Son of the Beach, 2002-2002. It's an over-the-top Baywatch parody full of childish sex jokes. The particular episode I'd watched was called The Gay Team. IMDB description, Notch must save Chip from Heenus Anus and the Gatrix, while BJ and Jamaica cause problems for Porcelain and her husband. Yes, I watched Heenus Anus abducting people to Gatrix when I was 6. I watched the episode online for the first time, I normally don't support piracy, but this time I had to do an exception, in 15 years. It was just as weird and traumatizing as it was as a child. Some kid made up a story about how, if you put a pound coin under a leftover cardboard box down this magic alley the rear of a local shop, then came back the next day it would become two pounds. Of course we all called him stupid, so he proved it to us. Grabbed a coin, shoved it angrily under a box, and we met up the next day. Bam. Two pounds. Naturally we assumed he had just run back before we got there and added another, so ultimately we weren't too impressed, but being the top investigators that we were, we decided to plant a coin of our own and not tell him. The next day we ran back, lifted the box. Two pounds. I mean at this point, as an adult, I probably would have assumed it was the shopkeeper amusing himself by watching our reactions on the CCTV after planting the extra coin himself, or even if I had believed it, stuck a grand down under there for extra profit. But no. As a kid, we just kept planting a pound coin for weeks and weeks. Every now and then we'd return and find just one coin, but we put this down to having to let the magic recharge. I'd forgotten about the magic alley completely until I was about. I dk maybe 20? Drink had made me more retarded than Donald Trump, so on the way home from the club I stopped for a good old bit of banter with an ancient homeless dude. I can't remember how it came up, but the old boy said watch this. 
followed him, somewhat stupidly, into a dark alleyway, where he promptly lifted a box left in the middle of the walkway, and tossed in a pound coin. I nearly sheet myself, when I realized exactly where I was. Magic Alley. Turns out that Hobo Bob had been doing this for over 30 years. Bob told me he just loved the reactions of the children, loved the legend he had created about Magic Alley, and just loved giving. Of course after realizing this homeless dude with barely a penny to his name, had given me well over 20 quid of the time I had abused the Magic Alley, no pun intended, I tried to give him the measly fiver that was left in my wallet, to which he refused. Sadly the man died a few years later of old age. Turns out he had a home, had a sustainable amount of money which he hadn't touched in god knows how long, and simply chose to live the life he lived as a magical money generating bum. I mean, in hindsight there's a good chance he was a bit of a predator with the nut loose, but I prefer to remember him as this kindly old magic man. My dad put a gun to my mom's head and threatened to kill her when I was in the 7th grade. She's a narcissist with borderline personality disorder. She wouldn't stop verbally abusing my father and being relentlessly passive aggressive. Like ever. She would just never ever stop every day for a few months when she was going crazy due to BPD taking over and because she's evil due to narcissistic personality disorder. My father is her enabler and also a narcissist. They were arguing, yelling, screaming, and cursing like usual, but this time was the last straw for my father and he snapped. He put a gun to her head and she just kept screaming over and over again thinking he was going to pull the trigger but he didn't. I realize now that she was testing him and taunting him by doing this. She wouldn't apologize and say oh no, I'm sorry don't kill me. She just kept screaming and in doing so was daring him to kill her knowing that he wouldn't. It was basically her way of abusing him the worst that she could by saying lol you loser I know you won't do it you need me and I own you. I can do anything I want around here, and she was right. I didn't know this happened until I was 26 years old and was thinking about the day of the screaming bloody murder. It happened on the floor above me, and I couldn't see it, and was too young to know what happened but was terrified. I couldn't figure out what could make her scream like that, and figured he was holding her down and threatening to beat her or something, and she was afraid. I realized when I was older that the one thing that could make her or someone else scream that way was having the gun that he kept in his drawer held to their head. It happened in their bedroom and that's where he kept his gun. That was 17 years ago. By the time I was in college I gradually started to hate them and stopped talking to or interacting with them. My father spit in my face a few years ago. My mother is trash and so is my father. I want to go to the police to tell them what happened, but the statute of limitations for aggravated assault with a deadly weapon have expired, and I have nothing but my word to go on with the cops if I talk to them. There's no evidence it happened. There aren't words to describe the hatred I have for them and the pain I'm in every day. There was this cat that lived opposite us when I was a kid. His name was Tigger, and he was genuinely the lost beautiful and friendly tabby cat I have ever known to this day. 31 now. He would rush to greet me from school every day and I would sit on the curb with him for a good few minutes before going back inside. When I was about 7, Tigger suddenly stopped greeting me after school and my mum told me that he had unfortunately died but that it was peaceful and in his sleep as he was an old man and was happy to go. I was genuinely inconsolable but sort of comforted that he had died peacefully. I even picked flowers from our garden and lay them where he used to sunbathe. Fast forward about 10 years later and I mentioned Tigger randomly to my sister. She's 5 years older and she said how horrible it was the way Tigger died. I was obviously confused and told her she must have gotten it wrong from what mum had said so she tried to change the story but I was now curious. I spoke to my mum and she told me that she had to lie to me when I was little because she had witnessed Tigger's death and it had genuinely traumatized her. She told me that 10 years ago she has been woken by what sounded like a garbled scream at 2 in the morning. She got out of bed and looked out the window to see Tigger being held by two greyhounds, one had his head and the other his back end. She said that Tigger was screaming in pain and fear as the dogs were pulling him in two directions. 
She was mortified and crying and ran downstairs to try and do something, but when she got there it was too late and Tigger had been killed. He had been split in two, ripped into two pieces. His owners has also heard the noise and came outside to find my mum kneeling on the road and sobbing over his body. His owners were obviously distraught so my mum helped them pick his body up and bury him where he would sunbathe and wait for me. One of the neighbors had said that they knew how much I loved Tigger and that they would never tell me how he had actually died and my mum agreed. I was so upset when I found out the truth because he really was my favorite cat and I felt like he was a friend to me throughout my childhood. So it wasn't really a mystery but the truth was finally, accidentally, revealed to me. I still think about Tigger every so often and I know my mum still gets upset if we talk about it. She said she felt guilty for keeping the truth from me, but there is no way I could have coped knowing how Tigger had actually died. Back in the 80s we, our parents, four siblings and me, lived in Southern California and used to go to Disneyland 2-3 days before Christmas because, unlike today, people hardly went there during the holidays and the longest line was about four people. Also my mom would do all pie baking prior to Christmas day. One day, we were all set to go, sitting in our van, waiting for our mom to finally be ready. She came out, striding to the van, angry as could be. Who ate the crust, she asked. My siblings and I all looked at each other wondering what she was talking about. Someone ate a piece of the crust of a pumpkin pie I baked for Christmas. If one of you doesn't admit to it, we are not going to Disneyland. Yes my mom was a bit overdramatic at times. My siblings and I continued to stare at each other, each of us silently begging the guilty party to step up and admit to being the crust thief. Their gaze settled on me, the youngest, and after proclaimed my innocence, we grew silent, hoping that she was kidding. She wasn't kidding. My dad, supporting his wife in following through on a threat, turned off the van and ushered us back into the house, deprived of our yearly trip. Our dad took us later that winter to make up for it. 20 years later, we were all sitting around a Christmas table, eating dinner and chatting. There were in-laws and kids, and the noise level was pretty loud. When the din naturally ebbed for a moment, we all heard my sister, the responsible middle child, say, I ate the crust. Instant silence for about two heartbeats, and then four adults yelling at her, why, why didn't you confess, it, was you, what, the hell, Heather. It quickly dissolved into laughter and reminiscing of our childhood trips. We never would have guessed it was her. And now whenever it's necessary we remind her that she ate the crust so she should suffer some punishment, like getting her piece of pie last. When I was 11 and in 6th grade, I learned to cuss. At school on Monday mornings I would buy my lunch tickets for the week. No ticket in hand then no lunch that day. The line was long and my friends and I would hang out in the line to get our tickets. I was cussing up a storm faking beach compass and goddamn dick hole that when I felt a tap on my shoulder, I turned around and it was my mom. I felt faint and instantly started sweating as my mom was, and still is, a devout anti-cussing Christian woman. I knew for a fact I was doomed but all she did was politely say, you forgot your lunch money. She handed it to me while saying goodbye and left to go to work. All day long I was sick to my stomach imagining the horrible punishment that was coming my way. I couldn't concentrate in class and was just a horrible mess. I finally got home and went straight to my room. My mom wasn't home from work yet but I was too nervous to do anything so I just sat on my bed. At around 5.30 she came home and poked her head into my room saying she'd have dinner ready shortly. I almost bathed with the tension. I was shaking I was so scared. 30 minutes later she called me and my sister to dinner and I trudged my way to the table. My mom and sister enjoyed light conversation with each other as they ate and I just pushed my food around on my plate until asking if I could be excused. I went back to my room to await my doom. I sat on my bed queasy with anticipation waiting for her to come in and punish me. At 9.30 she told me to bathe and go to bed. The next morning she woke me up and still didn't say anything. I couldn't figure it out, but I still knew I was in trouble. I went to school and came home expecting to be punished. Finally after a few days I stopped being so nervous and figured that she thought I punished myself much worse than she ever could have. 
Fast forward 33 years and I asked her if she remembered when she caught me cussing in 6th grade and how she let me suffer without giving me a formal punishment. She said that she had no clue what I was talking about and that if she'd heard me then I would've probably been grounded. I was floored. For over 3 decades I thought she had punished me by letting me punish myself when in actuality she'd never even heard my loud 11 year old voice saying dirty words. Go figure. When I was about 9 years old back in the early 90s, my friends and I somehow came into the knowledge that my next door neighbor had a hunchback secretly living in his house, perhaps a deformed relative that he was ashamed of. At night, we'd sit on a wall opposite the back of his house and we'd watch the silhouette of a hunchback running past the closed curtains over and over, as if he were running in clockwise circles in the downstairs living room. It happened every night, and it was so weird and uncanny, not just because of the bizarre shape of the humanoid shadow, but because it seemed to be on such a regular schedule. We came up with all sorts of explanations and possible descriptions of the figure, but no one could ever work out what was actually going on. My neighbor was a developmentally subnormal man who lived alone. He was very childlike and friendly. He had a vast VHS collection. So we came up with a ruse where one of the group would go to his house and ask if he could check out what movies he had, and while he was upstairs showing his collection, I would sneak in through the open door and search for the hunchback. So, that was the plan. At 9pm, about the time we usually saw the shadow of the hunchback running around, my friend went to his front door and the neighbor agreed to let him choose a movie to borrow. They went upstairs, and I slipped in through the front door. The plan went more or less perfectly, except that I didn't find anything. No extra people were in there, at least not downstairs, and the other kid who went upstairs to check out the VHSs didn't see anything weird either. And that was pretty much the end of our attempts to figure it out, even though the shadow kept doing the same thing. I even showed my dad one night, and we watched the shadow run by the window right on cue. He was baffled, but he laughed at the idea that there was a secret hunchback living in there. He was sure there was a less bizarre reason for this spectacle, my parents were friendly with him, and my dad would sometimes be in his house helping him with various DIY things. No hunchbacks in sight. Fast forward about 15 years, probably 10 years after the neighbor had died from a brain tumor, the hunchback thing popped into my mind again. I realized that I had never gotten an answer to the mystery, so I asked my dad if he remembered me showing him the weird shadow. He said he had actually forgotten about me showing it to him, but that he knew what it was we had seen. Except that it wasn't a secret hunchback hiding away in his house, like something from a Disney movie. I mean, by age 24, I knew it wouldn't be that. Turned out the neighbor liked giving his dog piggybacks. My dad knew this because he was in his house once when he was doing it and the neighbor explained how the dog loved it and it was their little routine every night before bed. My dad didn't learn of this until many years after I told him about the hunchback stuff, so I guess he just forgot to fill me in. I lost contact with most of the other friends who had seen the shadow with me back in the day, so I don't know if any of them ever learned the truth or if they'd even remember the shadow. Moral of the story, get blackout curtains if you don't want to become the subject of local ghost stories. I'm going to go about this one in a longer way because of what it means to me, but I promise to all of you that hate a dragged out story, I'm dropping a TLDR at the bottom. The first time we had a sleepover at my best friend's house, it was over the weekend of her 13th birthday October 28th, 1997. Despite having eaten an actual meal before she and I and one other friend began our junk food binge for the night, I wound up with a horrible pain in my stomach. Had it just been from a lot of sugar, having some protein after with some Pepto should have made it better. It didn't. Throwing up to rid my body of whatever was bothering it should have made it feel better. It didn't. It was the first time I had even met her dad, and he drove all over the place at 1 to 2 a.m. in pouring rain, trying to find a place open to see what else they could find for my stomach, because my bestie did not want me to leave. I legitimately don't remember if I went home or not. This was her 13th birthday and I'm now 35, so it's a bit fuzzy, but I think I went home. I do know we had a do-over at my place the next weekend, so we didn't spend the whole night with me throwing up and her trying to comfort me. 
I was violently ill, but whatever it was her dad picked up for me had antihistamines, and it felt like it helped some, then I would suddenly start getting sick again. My parents gave me more vibe and Advil when I was home the next day, and I slept all day and night long. When I woke in the morning, I finally felt better. My parents were sure it was because I had eaten pizza for dinner on top of all of the sugary treats because I had a sensitivity to dairy. I used to be able to word it that way or say I was semi-lactose intolerant. Now, it's definitely full-blown ally. That made no sense to me though because as I said, it was a sensitivity at the time and it took a lot of dairy throughout a few days or specific forms of dairy to even set my stomach off normally. Ice cream was a no-go, for example. I was drinking whole milk all the time at that point, though. My dad rarely made anything aside from pasta if he cooked, not for lack of knowing how to cook plenty of things. He just rarely did so, so I had a lot of mac and cheese and my absolute favorite food was when my mom made her homemade pizza. I was fine at school on Monday, and deciding I knew my own body better than my parents could, I decided to use a hot lunch ticket instead of eating the sandwich my mom packed me out of concern for my stomach. That meant eating pizza. I knew if my stomach flipped out over it, and I had to go home, my folks would be pissed. I almost never was allowed to stay home from school as a kid, even if I was legitimately sick, unlike my little brother, who got away with faking everything, but I digress. That's a whole other subject matter for another post. So, I had my pizza for lunch. I had my little carton of chocolate milk. I had a second little carton, because one of my friends wanted my Capri Sun. Deal. I didn't have a single problem that entire day or that night. Nothing ever happened from it, so I knew there was no way pizza at my friend's house had made me sick either. I told my folks about my little experiment, thinking they would want to know what did or didn't bother me, allergy wise. Instead, I got my student cracked for throwing out the sandwich and a lecture on wasting money. Not one other thing I had at the party or after was new to me in any way, nor did I have any recollection of any of those things bothering my stomach before, not the pop, ginger ale, pizza or different kinds of candy, but mostly pixie sticks. My bestie and I talked about it now and again over the years, when we would reminisce on our childhood. I had ruled out food poisoning, figuring there was no way it would have calmed over just a day, especially when no one else got sick. We just figured eventually that we would never know so there was no point in trying to figure it out years later. Still, we both would wander a bit from time to time, but had long ago stopped trying to figure out if it was something specific or just a bad gut ache. Fast forward to 2013. I, 28 now, was renting a room from a friend for a few months, and it was my first day off from my retail job post holidays. I decided I was doing absolutely nothing but playing World of Warcraft and decorating the giant gingerbread man cookies I had bought on post holiday clearance. I'm sure you can mostly see where this is going. I broke off a hand of one of the two cookies and started munching on it while I decorated the other at my desk. I had barely finished the third bite of this cookie when my tongue started swelling up fast and tingling. My throat was doing the same only my breathing was constricted. My throat was closing up. I have an extremely long list of allergies that I knew about up to that point so keeping Benadryl on me was my go to solution and now I remember what the other thing was I couldn't recall while speaking to my doctor recently. I have never carried an EP pen. I forced two Benadryl capsules down my throat and kept sucking on my water bottle until they were down, trying not to let my body throw the water back up. I sat there in my computer chair trying to force my body to let me take deep breaths, which was not an easy task. I figured if the swelling didn't go down at all in the next 10 minutes, I would drive myself to the hospital. To make sure someone knew what was going on, I messaged another friend in game. She's an IRL friend who lived just a couple streets over. I told her what happened, what I took, how long ago it was, and that I would still be sitting here talking in game. If I stopped replying without a BRB or AFK and didn't answer my phone, here was the address to tell 911. That I'll wound up unnecessary, thank god, because my throat had started to relax by the time 10 minutes had passed. The swelling in my tongue had gone down too, though both were still itchy and tingling quite a lot. 
By 20 minutes, my throat didn't feel too closed up anymore. My tongue had resumed almost back down to normal, but the itchiness was still there with both. I talked to my friend and played my game for another 5 minutes after throwing out all remnants of the gingerbread cookies and kit. At this point, a little over half an hour had passed. The drowsiness of the meds made me feel super tired, so I let my friend know I was going to go ahead and lay down, that I was setting an alarm and putting my phone out of reach, so I would have to get up to stop it. I set it to go off in 15 minutes, just to make sure I wasn't having any more trouble breathing. I would text her then and reset the alarm for an hour. All of that was unnecessary too, as I slept off most of the itchiness and I took another two capsules before bed that night. It was before going to sleep later that night that I realized what learning that I'm allergic to ginger meant. It was the ginger ale that had made me so sick that night 16 years earlier. It was the ginger ale that my bestest parents were encouraging me to drink, which I thought made total sense to help calm my stomach. Both of our families are from Michigan, where it's one of those you know you're from, insert state here, moments applied to us, that we don't need Pepto-Bismol for a stomach ash when there's Verna's. We were using the allergen trying to calm the reaction, and had no idea that was making it worse. I was so excited for a minute to call my bestie, and tell her, that I had figured it out after all this time, and in the worst possible way. I swiped up through my contact list, stopped at a name, hit the send button, and started moving the phone to my ear when it registered in my mind. I clicked the end call and just sat there for a minute staring at her name in the contact listing. I tried to hold back the tears that were coming. I couldn't call her and laugh at a little mystery finally solved because a texting driver had hit and killed her after she had walked her boys to school and was on her way home 14 months previously. It was exactly two weeks before she would have turned 28. I know this was an unnecessarily long way of telling the story I could have summed up in a paragraph or two, but even now, when any conversation comes up about allergies and what the scenario was that led somebody to learn about an allergy, my throat will feel tight for the whole other reason of never having been able to tell her. I've since told her oldest kid, also her oldest son, and in the fall of 2019, seeing him for the first time in 20 years, I got to tell her dad. It wasn't the same, and I hate it. She is the one person I immediately wanted to talk to over such a brief moment in my life that explained one memory of a brief moment of our lives and I just hate that I can't do that. TLDR. Got violently ill with horrible stomach pain at my first sleepover with my bestie for her 13th birthday back in 1997. Tried ginger ale to make it feel better and got sick again spent 16 years having no idea what caused it till I ate some gingerbread and nearly went into anaphylaxis. Briefly was excited to call and tell my bestie that I solved it, then remembered that she was killed just over a year before. I found out how the garage door opener displays actually worked. I loved going to Sears. Sears had these displays where they had scale model garage door openers and the worm gear would shuttle the part which connected to the door back and forth. The amazing thing about these displays were that there wasn't a button to operate them. These were special openers, probably very premium, which would work instantly with a clap. You've never seen anything like this before. They were mounted on a display, just a little out of reach for a 5, 7 year old, but it was the most exciting part of any trip to the store. Clap your hands once, and it would immediately jump to life. Clap again and it would return. Eventually when my brother was older, I'd take him to see the display, pushing the stroller. Parked a couple feet away, so that he'd have the best view, I clapped. Nothing happened. I clapped again nothing was working. The display was now head high, so I could actually see everything more closely. Everything looked the same, maybe a newer model. Would they get rid of the clapping feature? That seemed like such a huge selling point. I went to find a sales rep. I explained to him that their display wasn't working. I dragged him over and clapped my hands to show that it was broken, and this time the motor roared to life. I was delighted. Each time we went, the display was less and less reliable. Sometimes it would work, but sometimes it wouldn't. I told my dad that it was broken and dragged him over to show him. My dad hung back near the clothes rack across the aisle. I walked up to the display and gave perhaps one of the loudest claps of my young life. It was working again. 
proud that I fixed it. I looked over at my dad, expecting him to be proud of me as well, and his face was almost bright red with a grin from ear to ear he tried to hide behind one hand. His other hand I realized was holding a garage remote. It was a long con he had played me for years. I'm very late to this thread so no one will probably read it, but I wanted to share this story for so long now and never had the opportunity to do so. So here it is, it's quite long so there is a TLDR on the bottom, if you don't want to read it all. When I was a young girl I had dance classes. Once every two years our dance school would perform in the old theater in my city. The normal dressing rooms were reserved for the adults and teenagers, so the younger children had to get changed in a room that was usually one of the cloakrooms of the theater. I was 6 or 7 at the time, so I changed in the cloakroom. This room was quite big with two doors. One was the entrance and the other door on the opposite side of the room was closed. We were told by our dance teacher and parents that we were not allowed to open that door. And we got reminded of that almost constantly. Of course we all got curious about what was behind that door, but since we were all supervised by our parents no one dared to open the door. So nothing happened. Years later, I'm a teenager in high school and a theater project started with some other schools around where I lived. You could get extra credits for joining the project, and you would have no classes for a week because of performances and rehearsals. But I obviously joined out of interest for the arts. Usually my school reserved the auditorium for this yearly project, but they had another project planned at the same time. So for our project they rented out a theater in my city. You guessed it, it was the old theater. So during dinner break before the final performance, I decided to explore the old theater a bit, hoping to find something cool. While walking through the building, I suddenly remembered that faking door from 10 years ago. And so I went out on a mission to find it again, and to see what was behind it. Finding it again was easy, since cloakrooms are usually near the entrance of buildings. Also it was faking imprinted into my memory, because I was so curious about it back then. So there I was, I found it again. The door. The you're not allowed to open that or else door. I was so excited. I kinda expected it to be locked, but I put my hand on the door handle and... Darkness. The door was heavy, so it closed behind me. The only light I had when I entered was from the emergency exit sign above the door. Next to me, I saw bags of crisps in a big box, and in front of me some kind of cage. I quickly grabbed my phone and turned on the torch. And boy, it was glorious. In the open cage was the boo storage of the theater. It was a euphoric feeling for teenage me. I had never seen so many different kinds of strong drinks before. And well, I also never tasted most of those before. So naturally I took a sip from every bottle. Those that I liked I drank some more from. And so I was drunk during the performance. For some reason none of the teachers noticed or cared. The day afterwards I was sick lol. TLDR. Teenage me found the booth storage of a theater and got drunk. This story is about my grandpa, my dad's dad. He has been gone for almost 7 years now. I didn't even realize that I had a relevant story or that there was a mystery that needed solving until about a year ago, shortly after my 25th birthday. So my grandpa had this really cool lamp that could only turn on slash off when you clapped your hands. It only worked if all of the grandkids clapped our hands together and sometimes it did not work at all. When this happened, when it did not work, my grandpa would clap with us, and the light would suddenly turn on. Every now and then, one slash some of us would try to make it turn on slash off, while he wasn't there, and it would never work. We were all pretty young, all under 6, and we definitely thought that either my grandpa or the lamp was magical. I got to my elementary school years and kind of blew it off. Since I had seen some TV show where someone had some similar mechanism to a light that responded to clapping, I thought that maybe it was an older lamp and it didn't work as well all the time and this is why it worked when my grandpa helped. No more magical lamp. Mystery solved. Or so I thought. I recently told my boyfriend about my grandpa's cool lamp. He absolutely blew my mind when he said that my grandpa was probably just controlling the light switch at the wall while we were distracted. I had never gone back to reconsider the mechanism to this lamp. Hell, I haven't even thought about this lamp in more than a decade. 
Anyway, he tells me that my grandpa probably just flipped the switch when we weren't looking and while we were trying really hard to clap our hands. No way. I felt for sure that I would have been suspicious if he was standing near the wall every time the light went off, even though I was pretty young. I thought back and realized that this didn't really make sense though, since my grandpa wasn't always in the same place when the light turned off slash on. Maybe he had my grandma reach her hand in the room and flick the switch while we weren't looking. It made me sad that the lamp wasn't nearly as cool as I had thought. Mystery solved, I guess. But wait, there's more. Even more recently, I told my dad about it. My dad laughed for a good 5 minutes. Apparently the lamp had a corded foot switch that my grandpa repositioned every now and then to mess with us. My dad couldn't believe that it had taken me this long to realize that there was some trickery going on. I didn't think he, my grandpa, had much of a sense of humor until I figured this out. It made me love him so much more. Thanks for messing with us, grandpa. Lol. I went down and there were my dad and stepmother sitting at the table. They told me to sit down and also told me what was going on. Apparently, a piece of their built in expensive coffee machine went missing. My brother wasn't home. My little sister, she was three, couldn't have done because she was too small, so I must have done it. Completely confused about the situation I told them I didn't do it. But they wouldn't have it and it escalated. I was anxious and confused which made me look really guilty. I wasn't going to leave before I confessed they told me. Then the situation escalated. If I didn't do it, there had been thieves and they had to replace all the locks and call the police. They asked if that is what I wanted. I got pissed and told them to call the police. My stepmother had the phone in her hands and was failing numbers but eventually stopped. Having to admit she bluffed pissed her off more and she went as far as blaming me for losing me keys at my mother who lived 80 kms away. She must have stolen the key, drove all the way, and stole only that little piece. She was really disrespectful about my mother and I snapped. I just walked away and went to a friend. Fast forward, when I was in Rome I received a text message. They had called the company that built the machine and apparently there was a little mechanism that would rotate the piece 90 degrees, because then you have to clean it. Just the explanation, no apology. Bastards. What happened to my dad when he got a disease and moved out for a year? I was 7 when my dad was in the hospital and the only thing my mom would tell me was he has a disease. She wouldn't tell me what. But he was a smoker and I knew smoking could give you lung cancer, so I was convinced that's what it was and that he was going to die. I also knew that he had quit smoking for 4 years. He had smoked all my life, but my sister is exactly 4 years and 6 days older than me, so I did the math and figured he had quit smoking when she was born and started again when I was. I thought my existence was so stressful for him, he went back to it because of me and that I was the reason he got sick. Cause I was a kid and kids think the entire world revolves around them. After he was released from the hospital, he was sleeping on the pull-out sofa downstairs. I figured it was because he was sick and this way he didn't have to climb all the way upstairs. One night I was woken up by my mom and led to my aunt's car with my sister and a suitcase already packed for us. We spent a week or so with our aunt and uncle and they took us to the rainforest cafe and let us rent lots of movies and eat ice cream in the middle of the day. At the time I thought it was because they didn't have kids of their own and didn't know they weren't supposed to spoil us like that. When school resumed from Easter break, my teacher came over to me one day in lunch to say how sorry she was about my parents and how hard it was for kids when their parents divorce and that I could always talk to her. I was shocked and told her they weren't getting a divorce. I knew my dad was at a motel, but all my mom had told me was that my dad was moving to be closer to his job. My teacher hugged me and gave me the sad look, and I didn't understand why. My dad eventually moved in with a coworker who lived down the street from his job and my sister, and I got to visit him and see him at family parties. My mom made us go to this group with other kids who had parents they didn't see often, and a lady made us draw pictures about what we were feeling, and there were stupid videos but free cookies. One day my mom had a babysitter for us at night, because my dad was taking her out on a date. 
Soon after he moved back in, and things went back to normal, and I was quite smug that my teacher was wrong about the divorce after all. It wasn't until after my dad died, when I was in my early 20s, that I learned the disease he struggled with at the time was alcoholism, and that he was a high-functioning alcoholic, and had started drinking again, to cope with the pain after a bad car accident he was in, when I was young. I also found the hospitalization record saying he was being treated for depression, which hit me pretty hard, because I had suffered silently with it for years, and had just started treatment for it weeks before he passed, and I had never told him about it. Suddenly the spoiling from my aunt, sad hug from my teacher, group therapy all started to make sense. But of all the people who knew, nobody ever told me exactly what was happening at the time. My mom swears she told me it was a drinking problem, and that I was probably just too young to understand, but I don't recall that. I just recall asking her what's wrong with daddy and her repeating he has a disease, with exasperation until I stopped. Still boggles me how I spend a good portion of my childhood steeped in self-loathing, blaming myself for my dad getting sick, and moving out when it truly had nothing to do with me at all. Explain stuff to your kids, in ways they can understand people. When I was very very small, this man used to come to our house and demand it. It was his house and he wanted it. I had no idea what was going on. I was around 4 when the man sold his house and moved away. He would attack my mum, they'd scream, shout, they would get physical. I had memories of him jabbing her in the breasts with his fingers while I sat in my pushed chair. Now, my dad had died a few months before I was born. I knew nothing about him, not even his name. My mum would get so mad if I asked any questions about him, violent mad. I knew my mum had me late at 36, but this is where it gets messed up. I found out at 18 the man up the road was my half brother. I found out a year or so ago that when I was born, that man was 29. I also found out I have a half sister who is 36 years older than me. She is the same age as my mum. I found out my dad was 25 years older than my mum, he died at 61 years old, not in his 40s, like she had told me. I also found out my mum and dad were married for 3 years, not 10. I also found out my dad's first wife died a year before they were married. Now it all makes sense. Why that man hated my mum so much, why he wanted to take the house. I honestly don't blame him for being so angry. I'm not in contact with my mum, I don't blame him for hating her. It was a totally messed up situation. My grandparents were younger than my freaking dad. I don't know much more. I probably never will. The only relative I'm in contact with an older cousin, and a younger, but she is a lot younger than me, and he has no memories of my mum, being with my dad. He knows nothing about my dad. I found my half brother and sister. I also found their kids, but I haven't bothered messaging them. My mum said they never wanted me. I'm inclined to believe her, her family never wanted me, and made it very clear. I know no one from my dad's, I have a few memories of them, but nothing more. I don't blame them, if they didn't want to know me. Even though I'm not in contact with my mum, I'm still her kid. When I was 12, I had the strangest experience. It was at my friend's birthday sleepover party. She had invited four kids, including me, and we'd had a really great time. We watched movies, and played Singster on the PlayStation, and played card games and Truth or Dare. The next morning, we decided to watch another movie, Shark Boy and Lava Girl. Midway through the movie, the birthday girl paused the movie to gawk at Taylor Lautner. The other girls all started laughing and calling him cute. Even as a kid, I kind of cringed at this lmao. I was laughing along with the rest of the kids, when suddenly I felt this deep, black pit open up inside my stomach. I suddenly felt too small. Too big. Too visible. Yet nobody could see me. Or hear me. I suddenly had this horrible, horrible feeling that the world was ending, and I was the only person who knew about it. I just had this deep sick sense of dread. I didn't know where it was coming from, or what was happening. I just felt like everything in the world was about to end. Very soon. I stood very still, just trying to wrap my head around what I was experiencing, when one of the girls noticed my strange behavior and asked if I was okay. I started crying, but I couldn't explain why. 
I just told everyone I had a stomach ache. Then I called my dad and asked him to pick me up. For years I had no idea what had happened to me. I didn't know what to think. On the car ride home, it was sunny, I remember that, I just stared into space, trying to process everything. Trying to formulate the words. I didn't even tell my dad about it. I just couldn't articulate what had happened. I'm 25 now, and I can safely say, that was my first panic attack mayo. I've only had a few of them in my lifetime, but I've experienced plenty of anxiety. It's much easier to cope with once you know what is happening, and you have a plan to calm yourself down. I wish I could go back and explain that to 12 year old me. Poor girl really needed a hug. I only had one living grandpa as a kid, and he was kinda odd. He didn't behave like other adults. My grandmother had a southern accent, but my grandpa talked really funny to the point I couldn't always understand him. He was always the first person in bed at night and the last person up in the morning. He would randomly decide it was time to do a thing, and then we'd all have to drop everything and do that thing. For instance, one Memorial Day he decided my parents house needed better ventilation, and then he and my dad spent the whole weekend installing a new attic fan. But other times, you'd talk to him, and he wouldn't even respond. One day he randomly bought a brand new car that he didn't need and couldn't afford. Then he fell and broke his arm, but refused to let us take him to the air, insisting he was fine. Later that week, my sister and I were sent out of the house for a while, because a lady is coming to talk to Pop Pop and sometimes he gets mad during that. Three weeks later, he was dead. After the funeral, my uncle started acting really mad about everything, and then was taken to the hospital. I asked if we were going to visit, but they said this type of hospital didn't allow it. It was half a decade before my parents admitted that both my grandpa and uncle had bipolar disorder. The trouble talking was slurring because Pop Pop self-medicated. The extra sleeping was depressive behavior. The random projects, purchases, and odd decisions were manic episodes. The lady was a social worker trying to convince him to accept help, but he wouldn't because he tried to get help in the 1950s and been traumatized by the terrible mental hospital conditions in those days. And my uncle's mysterious hospital stay was a suicide watch because his father's death had triggered him. No visitors wasn't a hospital policy, they just didn't want me to see him like that. Life really makes a lot more sense when you're able to realize what things aren't normal adult behavior, but actual symptoms of a mental illness. There's a mystery I still haven't solved. My grandmother in Mexico died when my dad was 9. No one knows what really happened except for my father and his siblings. There was rumors of a car accident or an accidental gunshot. But no one knows. I can't bear to bring it up to my 73 year old father BC he always gets distant and despondent when I ask, I think I've directly asked him 2-2-3 times, but inferred more times. What I do know, from pieced together stories, is that my grandmother was my grandfather's mistress. My grandfather was a wealthy Mexican and his family was said to have owned a lot of land. Some of the land was even stolen by Pan Chovela. My grandfather was like an heir I guess, born on the same day and year as Hitler, and was a charismatic playboy I think. Anyways, lots of stories about this guy. Expert marksman, riding horseback to Texas to compete in competitions. Rode a motorcycle scooter thing, and got hit by a trolley slash bus and was fine. Thrown in a cell with his brother by Pancho Villa's guys, when they gave them money instead of joining them to fight. He, 60s, had a whole family with a wife and some kids. There was no secret of his mistress, 20s. She had four of his kids. They lived on the same property in another house. My grandmother's mother also lived there. My dad was, and still is, BFFs with his cousin my dad's half-nephew who is a year older than him. When my grandmother died, my dad and his siblings moved in with my grandfather's other family. For about six years. Until the oldest sister got married to a Mexican-American living in Michigan. She took along my dad and aunt. Oldest brother slash my uncle came along later. My dad grew up to be a well-rounded, straight-edged dude. He's told me so much else, but won't talk about this. I'm running out of time to find out what happened. I called a private investigator who said that all records in Mexico are not digital and most have to be located physically. Thus, 
financially impossible for myself to fund. I'm in the US, and I'm too scared to go there myself, sad but true. I kind of wondered if my grandfather had a role in my grandmother's death. Like if it was so bad that it can't be spoken about, what else could it be? My father was never close with his father, but never shut him out. Only my brother, who was a baby, got to meet my grandfather along with my mom when they went to visit everyone in Mexico one year. My grandfather died right before the 80s. I wonder if I'll ever discover the truth. If you have any tips, please let me know. TLDR, I don't think I'll ever discover the mystery of my grandmother's death. My father died when I was 4, and he had a large, 4 foot x 4 feet, safe in the basement, that only he knew the combination to Growing up I always dreamed of opening it. We tried to crack it a few times using a stethoscope and my mother thought she found the combination one day too, but it never opened. I always dreamed of what was in it, I was told he collected coins, but nothing for sure. When I was 33 my wife and I bought the house from my mother. I started doing research into the safe itself and was able to find who made it and that it was likely an old bank safe. I also found the procedure to opening the lock. It is not the standard left right left is a master lock. But we still did not have the combination, so we never got it open. Fast forward 3 years later as we are remodeling the basement storage area under the stairs where my mother always stored canned goods. There were a series of shelves that I was removing. As I was removing the bottom shelf, I flipped it over to carry it out and there was some writing on the bottom. When I saw it, I immediately knew what it was, it was the combination. I immediately stopped what I was doing and wrote it down on a piece of paper. I went straight over to the safe and tried opening it. It still took a few tries to open, but it finally opened. The safe was full of stuff. My mother's original driver's license certificate from the 60s, one of her SSN cards, my brother's and I birth records, and a lot of coins. Many silver dollars, some collector coin packs, and a lot of loose coins. We went through everything that night, piece by piece building more memories of my father. My family rarely talks about him, other than I'm very much like him, so it was a treat to get a glimpse of his life. We now use the safe to store our important documents and computer backups along with what he put in it. Nothing has been removed that was originally in it. I have gone 35 years with that stuff in it. Why not another 35 years? My parents were both in the RNR, Naval Reserves, and my mother, in particular, was the commanding officer of a huge unit on the coast. My dad was a lieutenant and never really had any aspirations to rise above that. He was the parade leader and loves that aspect of the job, the traditions and pomp and circumstances of it. It was a hugely important part of his life that he took very seriously, often volunteering for active duty work and traveling for duties. When I was about 12, my dad suddenly stopped traveling with us whenever we went to functions and appeared in uniform less and less right up until the moment he missed the Battle of the Atlantic Parade, which I could not understand. I tried to ask him about it and he just laughed it off, telling me that he was happy doing other things now, getting back into sports and other things, and would actually not be going back to the RNR at all. For years and years I was confused about this, I had no idea what was with this huge and sudden change of heart, I cannot express the extent to which my parents being in the RNR was a foundation in my childhood, and suddenly everything was different. I found out, not two years ago at the age of 25, that my mother, upon finding out my father was planning to divorce her, unrelated to any RNR thing, had manufactured a scenario where my dad disobeyed an order from a superior and had summarily court-martialed him. My dad was, on taxpayer money, flown around the country to multiple hearings, pled guilty to disobedience, he never denied it after the fact, and was eventually put before a military judge in Faslane. The case was thrown out by the judge in under 5 minutes, but my dad was so exhausted by the ordeal and convinced my mother would try something like this again that he retired from the RNR immediately. Of all the reasons I thought he'd give, when I finally felt I could ask, all these years later, your mum court marshaled me, was not what I was expecting. Kinda late, but I feel like I have to tell the mystery of the rogue condom. Me and my brother were hanging out in my room. 
My sister walks in, makes a surprised face, picking up something off the dresser. We gather around. It's a condom. We're all decently young. I knew it wasn't me who left it there. My brother swore it wasn't him. I had pretty good reason to believe it wasn't him, since he wasn't with anyone romantically and hung around a very conservative crowd. We also couldn't think of any friends that would have left it there. The three of us start to suspect that maybe it belonged to our parents. My sister and I convince my brother to ask my dad about it, but my dad has no idea where it came from. Condom gets thrown away. We all come to different conclusions. My mom and brother suspect a close friend who was dating a lot at the time somehow left it there despite the lack of evidence. I ended up suspecting my brother may have been running some tests or something. But still, that mystery always hung in the back of my mind. Until years later for the big reveal. We are out at this big ranch, house where my sister's wedding would be taking place in the next couple days. People are drinking. My sister and some of the bridesmaids start acting funny. That's when I get curious and ask what's going on, and my sister admits to the whole thing. She put the condom there. She went on to tell the story. Her and our cousin were hanging out at a convenience store and my sister thinks it would be funny to buy condoms. She convinces our cousin to buy a whole box of them, but once they have the condoms, they have no idea what to do with them. My sister decides to just keep one and let the cousin keep the box, but my sister still doesn't know what to do with it. But an evil idea started to form. She decided it would be funny to leave the condom on the dresser in my room and see what chaos would play out if one of us or our parents found it. The thing was, no one noticed it. A whole week went by and we didn't even see it. So she decides to take matters into her own hands and discover the condom on her own while my brother and I are in the room, which led to the whole thing. A few days go by and she's sitting in the car with our mom who is talking to her about the condom and trying to deduce the culprit among us and our friends. My sister starts to feel guilty and makes the mental note in that moment that she would confess, but not until she was married. And there I was, days before her wedding, when she confessed to me the truth, concluding the mystery of the rogue condom. Edit, spelling, grammar, and structure. For my 5th birthday, my mum and I went to the local SPCA, and we got a dog each, we both fell in love with our pups. Maybe 3 to 4 months later we were outside blowing bubbles and the dogs were having fun chasing the bubbles. One dog got to close as the other bit at the bubble, and the other dog thought the bubble biting dog was attacking, and a fight broke out. We managed to separate the dogs, and took them to the vet. Me being 5, I didn't know the process of it all, so I happily waited for my dog to return. About a month later my dog still hadn't returned, but my mum's one did. My mum asked if I loved my dog, I said I do. She asked why I hadn't asked about my dog thinking I didn't like it. She then told me that the vet loved my dog too much and decided to keep my dog. I was heartbroken, but thought if this vet loved my dog more than me, it should only be right that the dog have a good life. Several years go by and it the memory kept returning. Now I was older and I could actually piece a few things together. I knew the story didn't add up. That guy stole my dog, and we didn't go to court and get my dog back. But I didn't want to call my mum a liar. Nearly a decade and a half after getting the dog originally, I asked my mum about it telling her my thoughts. She broke down at tears, turns out my parents were going through a separation, but have since come back together, and my mum wasn't earning much, she had sold my dog, and kept her own. I was glad to have finally known the truth. I straight up forgave my mum, and she cried even more. Only kicker for me her dog, passed away 4 years ago I will never know about my dog, if it had a good life, and when she passed away. When I was maybe 8 or 9 years old, I was allowed to use the family computer unsupervised, since I would play games like Neopets and Club Penguin however, one day my brother, who was 10 or 11 at the time, was using the computer and was playing some game with stick figures and cannons. I had never seen it before, and it looked super fun. Later on that day, I visited that website to play the game. That was when I saw this game ad that depicted various things like targets, which claimed if you hit the targets you could win a free iPod Touch slash iPhone. I clicked on it, and it would tell you to fill out all of some of your information, like home phone number, email, 
The only information I knew was my house phone number, and I'm pretty sure I just made up an email, since I didn't know my mom's email. It would also make me fill out surveys, constantly telling me that I have almost completed this survey then direct me to another survey. All the while I would jump from survey to survey thinking I would get the iPod. I would do these surveys, fill out my house phone number like hundreds of times a week. It never dawned on me as a kid that I'd never get the iPod, lol. While all of this was happening with people filling out surveys with our house phone number, my mom was getting dozens of calls daily from telemarketers and scammers. We would get these calls all day, every day, and at all hours of the day plus night. We would get them, even when we would move houses, which would result in our house phone number getting changed. Eventually, my mom lost her patience, since it was such a nuisance. I remember my mom slamming the phone on the hook out of frustration bc of the telemarketers plus loudly saying why do they keep calling? How did they get this number? The next time a scammer called, my mom, who was normally very calm and quiet, lost her sheet in a way I'd never seen before, lol. Well, fast forward 15 years later. I'm now 23, and I was having a conversation with my boyfriend about those games where I thought I would win the iPod. We laughed, and I said I never understood the point of those games slash surveys. What possibly could they have gotten out of me filling out the phone number? That's when my boyfriend says that they were taking the information and probably calling slash mailing stuff to my house. It took about 45 seconds after him saying that for the light bulb to go off. I realized that I was the reason for my mom getting harassed by telemarketers, and that my mom never realized it was BC of the iPod surveys. Sadly, my mom died years before I made the connection between the telemarketers plus the survey slash games, so she has absolutely zero idea how they kept getting out number despite moving several times, though, I do get a chuckle out of it when I look back on the whole situation. I've always had a good memory with faces. Each year we would go see Santa at the mall, tell him what we wanted, and take a photo. We always went to the same mall. For maybe two, three years Santa was the same. Whatever that meant. I loved Santa and talking to him. He was a great guy. Then the following year there was something off about him. Their glasses were different, their facial bone structure, their eyes, their nose everything was off and it really freaked me out. They spoke and asked me what I wanted, and the voice was different. I was on the verge of tears, but I worked through it Santa is magical, if not unnerving in his use of it. With my voice quivering in terror I explained I'd been a good kid and what I wanted, and then we took the picture. My mom asked me what was wrong, and I couldn't convey my thoughts, and just said I don't like that Santa. The following year Santa was different again. He didn't look the same as the first time I saw him, or the last time I saw him. I knew right away I didn't like this Santa either. For a couple of weeks, before we took the photo, whenever we would go to the mall casually, not for the photo, I would just stare at him, but from behind a pillar or another person. I would walk around the display area and just watch him. I knew he knew what I was doing at all times so hiding in any way I could was critical. This was a delicate situation. Eventually we went to see Santa, and I did not want any part of it. I protested and whined. My mom said yes, but we need a photo of you and Santa. You'll look back on it as a happy memory. So when they put me in his lap I protested the only way I could. I took part in the niceties. I was very cordial with this Santa. Told him I'd been good and what I wanted, but when we both turned to face the camera I did not smile for the photo. The photographer tried to get me to smile, but couldn't do it. I did not want to play any part in this charade. It was all too disturbing. This was not Santa. After this photo, I didn't take photos with Santa again. From my parents' perspective it was too expensive for pay for a photo your kid wouldn't smile in, and they were obviously distraught at the idea of taking photos with Santa. After this photo I stopped smiling in photographs for years as a form of protest against photos of myself. I could be having the happiest day of my life, and if someone pulled out a camera the developed image would have me glaring at them. From major 6, 14 there's hardly any photos of me smiling in a picture. I earned the nickname Angry Eyes among my peers, which I wore as a badge of honor. Kids are weird. Guys I after many many years I finally know what's going on. The guys at the mall are actually different people. 
They do a valuable service helping Santa as his representatives and visit lots of kids at malls all over the world. This enables kids to talk to his representatives directly and take a nice family photograph. Don't let your kids get disturbed and traumatized by it like I did. I thought it was actually Santa. Tell them the truth. Got an RC car for my birthday from my dad's older sister and her husband. I was probably 4 at the time it was cool. It had actual functioning headlights, blue police blinkers. Not very fast, but I didn't care. I have never gotten a straight answer, but through deduction, I have understood what happened at the end of that birthday. My uncle approached me. He's a bit of a funny guy. A true tinker, an omen human form. Complete with big spectacles, walrus stash and bushy eyebrows. Even back then I knew he was someone who fixes a lot of things. I had been to his workshop. He gets down on one knee, smiles, pats my head. Apologetic, he says that my new favorite toy needs to come back with him. My dad is standing some ways away, talking to my aunt, but he's in earshot. Uncle proceeds to tell me that there's a defect. Something about this ussy car isn't right. So being the naive little boy I am, I accept. For months, years even, I ask my parents. When am I getting my RC car back? Their casual dismissal of the question turns to feigned ignorance. I don't remember this thing gaslighting me, I realize. Years turn to decades. I'm now 28, and I still think about it once, or twice a year. Well. It was loud those electric brush motors. It had a blaring police type of siren. It took like 6 to 8 AA batteries. In the 90s. My parents told my uncle and aunt to give it to someone else. I was a young energetic little bastard. We lived in a small apartment, my dad woke up with the sunrise, my mother still studying for her nurse certification. Simply put, kids with loud toys make life hell for the parents. I'm not even planning on being one myself, but given my incredibly short patience with children, I understand and feel this mystery is solved, finally. When I was around 12 my aunt took both me and my little sister in after our mother died and our dad abandoned us. One day her watch went missing and she accused both me and my little sister of taking it. This was a very expensive watch. She demanded we return the watch or we would be made homeless and sent into care. But both me and my little sister hadn't seen the watch. Then the police became involved and we were interviewed separately. They hoped we'd both sell the other out. They told my aunt that we were the two most guilty looking children they had ever seen, but we were sticking to our stories. We were grounded for weeks and this became a very heated argument for many years. I was once thrown out when I was 18 for being a lying ungrateful thief who's a constant embarrassment I dyed my hair orange. I was recently helping my aunt decorate the house well over 15 years later when I came across a loose panel in my aunt's bedroom which would have been under her bed. What was underneath that panel? My aunt's missing watch. She claims she has no idea who put it there, and that maybe I did it as a teenager out of spite. Who cares it was so long ago? The way she brushed it off, and the fact that I know it wasn't me or my sister means it could have only been my aunt, but why? Why if she had hidden the watch did she involve the police? Why did she constantly use it against us growing up to tell us what awful people we were? For many years she did actually cause a slight rift between me and my sister, since we just wanted two accusations, to stop and suspected each other. That's a new mystery I guess, but we solved where the missing watch was. When I was in preschool, I didn't like to color in the lines. I just scribbled over the picture and got it as close as I could. The art teacher used to scream at me and tell me I was stupid. One day she just stopped talking to me. Like, straight up wouldn't acknowledge me in her class. She'd throw papers and crayons in front of me. I kept trying to do better, but she wouldn't even talk to me. Well, two years later, when my brother went there, I told him how mean the art teacher was. My mother told me that I had scared him, and so he was only going to school three days out of the week because she wasn't there on the other two. I felt terrible. A few years back I saw in the obituaries that the art teacher died. I texted my mother and she responded, oh, yeah she hated us because I got her fired. Turns out we ran into her in the drugstore. My mother said, look, it's Mrs. Teacher. Don't you want to say hi? I hid behind her leg and wouldn't say anything. 
She told my mother to buy scissors and crayons because I was uncoordinated and didn't know how to cut or color. My mother responded, isn't that your job to teach him? She replied, no, absolutely not. Your son is not even close to what the other children can do. Well the art teacher went into the next aisle, saw another mother, and told her she'd just run into me, and, using my full name, said I, couldn't hold a scissor or color on the lines, if my life depended on it. Which, of course, my mother overheard. My mother wrote a letter to the principal of the school that, if she ever found out the teacher spoke negatively about me again, she would have both of their jobs. The principal offered my mother a very sincerely apology and promised that it would not happen again. That's when the teacher stopped talking to me and she was fired at the end of the school year. By the time my brother got there, she was long gone, but she just wanted him to do three days a week at opposed to five. She told me I scared him because she didn't want me to be bitter or angry over what had happened with the teacher. She didn't realize I felt guilty for years after thinking I had deprived my brother of two days of preschool. When I was in preschool, I didn't like to color in the lines. I just scribbled over the picture and got it as close as I could. The art teacher used to scream at me and tell me I was stupid. One day she just stopped talking to me. Like, straight up wouldn't acknowledge me in her class. She'd throw papers and crayons in front of me. I kept trying to do better, but she wouldn't even talk to me. Well, two years later, when my brother went there, I told him how mean the art teacher was. My mother told me that I had scared him, and so he was only going to school three days out of the week because she wasn't there on the other two. I felt terrible. A few years back I saw in the obituaries that the art teacher died. I texted my mother and she responded, oh, yeah she hated us because I got her fired. Turns out we ran into her in the drugstore. My mother said, look, it's Mrs. Teacher. Don't you want to say hi? I hid behind her leg and wouldn't say anything. She told my mother to buy scissors and crayons because I was uncoordinated and didn't know how to cut or color. My mother responded, isn't that your job to teach him? She replied, no, absolutely not. Your son is not even close to what the other children can do. Well the art teacher went into the next aisle, saw another mother, and told her she'd just run into me, and, using my full name, said I, couldn't hold a scissor or color on the lines, if my life depended on it. Which, of course, my mother overheard. My mother wrote a letter to the principal of the school that, if she ever found out the teacher spoke negatively about me again, she would have both of their jobs. The principal offered my mother a very sincerely apology and promised that it would not happen again. That's when the teacher stopped talking to me and she was fired at the end of the school year. By the time my brother got there, she was long gone, but she just wanted him to do three days a week at opposed to five. She told me I scared him because she didn't want me to be bitter or angry over what had happened with the teacher. She didn't realize I felt guilty for years after thinking I had deprived my brother of two days of preschool. I got highlights magazine for kids when I was young. I loved all the activities and games in them. We adopted our family Dalmatian from the next door neighbor and they had my dog's mom and sister, who I of course also considered family. I was excited to go get my magazine from the mailbox, and on the way back, I held it over the fence to show my dog friends. Well, I think these dogs got it with newspapers, because when I waved the magazine at them in my childhood excitement, they ripped it from my hands and tore it to shreds. I cried oh man I was so sad. I went inside and threw my sobs into my mum's lap, and she patted my head. She looked out the window as I described between gasps about the carnage of my favorite thing ever, and I didn't get to do the seek and find, and I bet Goofus and Galland was good too and now I'll never know. Mom got me to go have a nap, and said she'd have a snack for me when I got up. She woke me up with a breakfast in bed serving tray with snacks, juice, and my highlights magazine. I felt so much love for my mom in that instant. She fixed it. For me. I saw it get torn to shreds and this goddess of a lady pieced it all back together and saved me from heartache. I pictured her in a teeny room, surrounded by paper shreddings and piecing them together with a clipboard, like you see in the spy movies, when they recover shredded documents one strip at a time. 
My mom is a bit of a hoarder, and when I was in college I went through her old bookshelf to try and convince her to get rid of some stuff. She had kept all the highlights magazines. As a kid we could cut them up for other projects, but I didn't think she still needed them. So I sorted through to find ones we could donate if I hadn't written all over them. I found the ripped one. I had to go confirm with my mom this was a ripped edition that she taped back together. She stifled a laugh and said yes. The front cover got torn off, only like one third of the cover got ripped off. She taped it back on with scotch tape, like just one piece of tape on the front and one on the back to seal the single rift. Interested to see it in my adult eyes and realize how much of a tragedy I had blown it up to be in my childhood mind. Finally explained how my humble mother pieced together hundreds of magazine scraps in the span of a nap. I was in Cub Scouts and I went on a weekend camping trip with my dad and the rest of the pack. I'd learned about solar power in school that week, and brilliant child I was, I built a little solar marshmallow roaster that, I'm theory, focused sunlight on a marshmallow skewered on a spit that I could rotate. Anyways I had no idea what I was doing, and it didn't work at all. But I didn't know if it didn't work at all, or it was just taking a long time. So I thought okay, maybe I'll just leave it for a while and see how it goes. And I went off to do something else. After a while, my dad reminded me to check on my marshmallow. So I did, and wow it was perfectly roasted. My machine worked this is amazing. Many years, and a great deal of intellectual development. Later, I was telling the story to some family friends, and my dad was there. But part way through telling the story, I realized that there is no way 8 year old me had the engineering chops to actually make an effective solar oven. And I couldn't have actually roasted it perfectly if I wasn't there to rotate the spit. So I kind of trailed off, visibly confused. So my dad spoke up. Turns out him and one of the leaders could clearly see that my machine wouldn't work. Didn't take a genius to see that, but they didn't want me to get discouraged about being curious and experimenting, so they cooked up a brilliant plan. One of them roasted a marshmallow on a fire and replaced it in my machine, and then my dad reminded me to check it and how's that? Little Hoyland is inspired and overjoyed. I did feel betrayed for a hot second, but once I thought about it a bit I decided it was harmless a long time ago, and it really did inspire my interest in science and technology. So we came down on the side of well played, sir. In first grade we were assigned to literally find a fossil out in the woods. Now that I'm about to have a kid and have gone through upwards of 10 years of upper level science education, I realize how ridiculous this assignment was now. However, I dutifully dragged my dad out every day for a week to go looking for fossils. One day my dad said I think we are going to get lucky today. I read that fossils are more likely to be by a lake. We coincidentally lived very close to a lake. So my 7 year old self has renewed hope and we go out looking that day by the nearby lake. My dad points and says maybe we should look in the sand over there. There are some rocks that look like they could have been there for a long time. I look and look and finally see a white rock that looks out of place. We turn it over and I ecstatically found a fossil. I proudly cleaned it and took it to class. I still remember a classmate telling me it was weird that it was so white, but I of course was so offended and swore my dad and I found it by a lake. I put it on my bookshelf for years. My dad finally told me a few years ago he actually bought it at a museum and placed it there lol. I'm honestly embarrassed I didn't figure it out before he told me. He also told me it was impossible to whistle backwards, and when I got really good at it, he said he wanted to tell David Letterman and that we might be able to get on the show. I practiced and practiced and practiced. I told my husband last year I could whistle backwards thinking he would be impressed, and he immediately started doing it too. I called my dad, and he laughed for two hours, and said it was just his creative way to keep me busy. Again, I'm going to be a doctor in a year and he fooled me for 30 years he was so enthusiastic about it back then. I grew up in a very mountainous rural area. In the summertime, at night, the silhouettes of the mountains would sometimes light up. A bright, white light would illuminate the ridge line for miles in all directions. It would do this a few times every week or so. Maybe 5 to 10 flashes in an hour period. I remember thinking as a kid that can't be real. 
so I brought my dad out to watch one night. He saw it too. Fast forward a decade or so. I'm 18, and high off on a lake boat with my parents and their college friends. I see the flash, and then ask them all to watch the mountains and to clap, if they see anything. Without fail, we all see it, and clap simultaneously for like 30 minutes every few minutes. We debate on the possible cause for hours. We eventually boiled it down to atmospheric smoke particles causing static electric discharge really far away, and the light travels easier than the sound of any thunder. There were never any storms in the immediate area, but it did always happen in forest fire season. To this day, I'm still not totally sure what causes this flashing. The area behind the mountains is one of the largest wilderness areas in the lower 48. I'm talking a piece of land the size of some eastern states that has nothing in it but wildlife and mountains. There is no reasonable man-made explanation for this within the bounds of what the public knows about that area. The next step would be to simultaneously observe the flashing as well as a rare particulate and electrostatic discharge map and correlate. I'll be back this coming summer, and I fully intend on investigating. Part of me wants it to remain a mystery. My dad used to be a volunteer firefighter when I was a kid. One night I remember being woken up by him, packed into his truck along with my younger brother, and brought to a friend's house for a surprise sleepover I knew it was because he had to go help put something out, so I wished him luck and had a good time hanging out with my friend. This was a little strange however, because this was the first time he'd taken us to a friend's house instead of having our mom pick us up. It was also worrying, because I clearly remembering him picking us up and looking like he'd seen death itself. Years later I remembered the event and asked him about it. Turns out my memory was wrong. I didn't stay there for one night but two. There was a massive brush fire caused by a car crash and it basically turned the entire area into a hellscape. He didn't elaborate much, but it sounded like this fire was out of the local guy's depth before they even got there and had to bring in people from all over the state. He didn't pick us up until the morning a day later meaning he'd spent over 24 hours helping and trying to track down what had happened to my mom. I also learned that the reason my mom didn't pick us up was because she'd gotten caught in it. Thankfully she wasn't in the main crash, but only a few cars back and was basically stuck pinned in the paloop. She wasn't injured, but had to go to the hospital due to smoke inhalation and cuts from breaking her car window to escape. Guess I'm a dumbass for not remembering that she had a completely different car a week later when we did see her. He described to me how terrified he was when he got a glimpse at the pile of burning cars through the smoke and recognized her car amongst them. They'd been divorced for a year or two by this point, but still not something you'd wish to see in an emergency. So basically, for over 24 hours the mom of my friend was freaking out cause the parents of the kids she was looking after were in the hospital and fighting the nastiest fire the area had seen in years. My brother has no memory of the event and I guess I never really learned the full story. Okay so my mom, dad and brother all have brown eyes, I have blue, and never really thought much about it until I started learning genetics in school and thought HMMOK am I adopted. I always felt like I wasn't fully in touch with my family, but whatever as far as I knew that was my mom, dad, and brother since my first memories. Not long after my mom sat me down to talk and broke the news that the man I was calling my father was actually not biologically my dad and my brother was only my half-brother. My biological dad was an abusive coke addict and my mother left him a week after I was born because she realized that was not the man she wanted me to grow up to be. I received this news at age 12 and 3 years later my mom tells me that she found my sister, my half sister, same father, she was 18 and I was 15 and it was hard trying to keep a steady relationship but we did fun stuff every month or so until we just lost touch. At age 17 I found out where my father lived and found out I had another half-sister who was 16 only a few months younger than me. I hated it. He was still in her life abusing her and her mother and I was the lucky one to have escaped without any contact with him. I wish it was me. I wish both my sisters never had to deal with him and that I took the 18 years of pain instead. There is a lot more detail to this story but for now I'll keep it short. I still haven't met my second sister, but have found out she has been out of contact from our father for a few years now. 
I don't know what he looks like because I refuse to see pictures of him because if I ever came across him in real life I would kill him with my bare hands and no that's not a joke I want him dead and I'm the kind of guy that does not wish death on anybody but this man has ruined the lives of people I love and that's unforgivable. For my whole life I've had trouble with steps in math. I can do some simple addition, subtraction, and division, but only if it's less than 3 or so steps to complete. Preferably small and a whole number. Fractions terrify me. I've had teachers and legal guardians alike try harsher and harsher punishment trying to get me to learn math. I've thrown at least dollar sign 3k at either remedial math classes and one on one tutoring by a certified math genius. My math teacher in third grade actually had me drag my desk to the front of class and proclaim loudly, hey everyone, that square chick is crying again, everyone look at her, so she can get the attention she wants. I didn't think people could be so cruel, so I just cried more quietly from then on, all while trying to see the chalkboard, by craning my neck backward, since we were under no circumstances to turn around in our seats or turn the seats around. I had to take a group of neuropsychological tests after a car accident to test and see if my brain got injured in the thinking areas. Turns out I have math disability. It's called dyscalculia and it's a math learning disability that impairs an individual's ability to learn number related concepts, perform accurate math calculations, reason, and problem solve, and perform other basic math skills. Dyscalculia is sometimes called number dyslexia or math dyslexia. Son. Of a flea button. Dusty. Camel faking. Cork master. I could have been getting help when it was relevant to my kid's sponge brain but no. I had to get grounded, scolded, whipped with a wisteria vines, forced to listen to math music, and do worksheets and cry. Because after a few steps I forget where I was, and I look at the problem to try and suss it out. But it's like the numbers switched places, or are backwards, so I can't keep track, even if I write it all down. I wish I had known about this sooner. <laughs> OMG have I got one. My grandpa was Armenian, born in Salonika, Greece, in 1925. His family was dirt poor. He was super street smart, and he would tell us stories of passing hashisk and shining shoes to put food on the table when he was 15. His mother had gone crazy after the Armenian genocide in 1917, and he was the sole breadwinner. After the war, he somehow made his way to France and met my grandma on the day of the liberation in Paris. He was planning to continue on to America, but they fell in love, stayed in France, and started a family. We never really knew what he did during the war, how he left Greece, and ended up in France. He never talked about it, and we all assumed he had been a prisoner somewhere, or in forced labor, and that it was too traumatic. He also never went back to Greece, ever. Well, when he died, 10 years ago, we reunited with extended family, and we finally learned. Turns out that he had served as a translator to the Germans during the occupation of Salonika. When the city was liberated, he was considered a collaborator and a traitor, and the local resistance wanted him dead. He fled with the help of the German army, the story goes that they even got a German uniform, etc. To this day, I think he is still condemned to death in Greece. Now the twist is, my grandma was Jewish and a Holocaust survivor. She and her family emigrated to France in the 30s, where they thought they would be safe, but they were wrong, and in 1942 all got deported and died in the camps. For some miraculous reason. She wasn't at home the day they all got arrested and survived them all. TLDR, we learned after his death that my grandpa, who was married to a Jew and whose children are Jewish, was a collaborator to the Germans during the war. <laughs> OMG have I got one. My grandpa was Armenian, born in Salonika, Greece, in 1925. His family was dirt poor. He was super street smart, and he would tell us stories of passing hashisk and shining shoes to put food on the table when he was 15. His mother had gone crazy after the Armenian genocide in 1917, and he was the sole breadwinner. After the war, he somehow made his way to France and met my grandma on the day of the liberation in Paris. He was planning to continue on to America, but they fell in love, stayed in France, and started a family. We never really knew what he did during the war, how he left Greece, and ended up in France. 
he never talked about it, and we all assumed he had been a prisoner somewhere, or in forced labor, and that it was too traumatic. He also never went back to Greece, ever. Well, when he died, 10 years ago, we reunited with extended family, and we finally learned. Turns out that he had served as a translator to the Germans during the occupation of Salonika. When the city was liberated, he was considered a collaborator and a traitor, and the local resistance wanted him dead. He fled with the help of the German army, the story goes that they even got a German uniform, etc. To this day, I think he is still condemned to death in Greece. Now the twist is, my grandma was Jewish and a Holocaust survivor. She and her family emigrated to France in the 30s, where they thought they would be safe, but they were wrong, and in 1942 all got deported and died in the camps. For some miraculous reason, she wasn't at home the day they all got arrested and survived them all. TLDR, we learned after his death that my grandpa, who was married to a Jew and whose children are Jewish, was a collaborator to the Germans during the war. Edit, added a TLDR. Just before my 6th birthday my father died in a motorcycle accident. Him and my mum were separated, but we were told his estate went to us kids, and that we would get an inheritance when we turned 18. My mum quickly married her piece of sheet boyfriend of the time, and it seemed that suddenly, we were off on some camping van adventure up the east coast of Australia. I was baffled by the 3 month long absence from school and even more baffled when we suddenly moved to a town 900kms away from my grandparents where we had been living prior to my dad's death. All of my childhood my mum told us she got nothing when dad died. That she had struggled taking care of us kids. She convinced us to each give her a couple of thousand dollars from our inheritance when it came as a thank you for her trials and tribulations whilst raising us. Many years after, when I was staying with my granddad before moving overseas, I mentioned how shitty it was that mum had gotten nothing to help take care of us after dad died. My granddad looked at me and said of course she did. She got nearly a million dollars. She just pissed it all away and let that idiot stepfather of yours get his fingers into it. And suddenly a whole bunch of stuff from my childhood became clear. She had lied and wasted money that was meant to keep us out of the poverty we loved in. Then she had lied more to extort guilt money from us when she had wasted it all. That camping van trip in itself wasted at least $100,000. The house they bought without checking its structural faults. Another couple of hundred thousand. The next house, even more. Then the next house was worse and got condemned and we lost our home cause they didn't have any money left. A quick conversation with my grandfather solved so many mysteries for me and made me so, so angry 